All right. So let's let's talk about a real genius. So one of my favorite quotes actually comes from a genius by the name of Confucius. And the quote is, if you tell me, I will forget. If you show me, I may remember. If you involve me, I will understand. And one of the reasons why this particular quote has become a touchstone for me is because it reminds me that life is experiential. And the most powerful experiences in my life are the ones where I was an active participant. The first time I had to sing a solo in front of a public audience. Um, my first kiss. Um, writing and performing a solo theater piece in grad school. All of these things were very much active on my part and have therefore resonated with me for many years after that, decades after they happened. So if the arts industry wants audiences to have deeply resonant experiences with art, then the question arises, how can artists and arts organizations go beyond telling their audiences about their work or even showing the patrons the work and actually involve them in the work? Gwydion talked this morning about a lot of technology tools that have flooded our consciousness in the last decade. And all of these tools have kind of propelled us quickly and forcefully into a participatory culture. What do I mean by that? This is a culture in which people are not, or we're not only consuming culture, but we're actively producing it and contributing to it as well. So in 2006, a media researcher by the name of Henry Jenkins and his colleagues, they published a white paper called Confronting the Challenges of a Participatory Culture. And in that paper, they identified five defining characteristics of a participatory culture. And so I'm positing that we are living right now in a participatory culture. And so what I'd like to do this morning is walk through these five defining characteristics and discuss ways in which artists and arts organizations are amplif or exemplifying these characteristics in a way in which the audiences become actively participating and involved in the work. So to start, a participatory culture has relatively low barriers to artistic expression and civic engagement. So we've already talked this morning about the fact that all of these tools are out there on the web, right? And we are in an open source, I want to download it for free right now kind of world, so I can do that. I can go out on my laptop and I can download all of these tools to create and express myself, and then I can turn around and I can go to all of these free services and I can actually distribute and share them with the world. So 
the barriers for people to create and disseminate those creations, the barriers are quite low now. Over 75% of people in the United States have access to a computer with an internet connection. 93% of people in the United States have mobile phones or access to mobile phones if you're under the age of 18 and your parents won't let you use it except at night. Those tools right there, with those tools, just those tools, you can create and disseminate and distribute. The barriers are low. One of my favorite things that has come up in the last couple of months is there's a tool called Broadcaster, and it's Broadcaster without an E. So <laughs> there's just Broadcast R. Um, and what it is, is Broadcaster is what's called a location-based social media tool that allows people to record up to three minutes of audio and then they can attach or locate it to a specific geographic place. The idea behind Broadcaster is that people can tell their stories and then people can attach those stories to a particular geographic location and then people who are on Broadcaster's website or are using the Broadcaster app on their iPhone see an actual map with all of these little pins on it and each pin is connected to audio. So many of you in the room may have heard of a group called the Neo Futurists. So they're a theater performance group that were originally uh, established here in Chicago. They have a New York chapter and the New York chapter uh, approached Broadcaster and asked if they could partner with them on this project. So the Neo Futurists, they have um, a show called uh, Too Much Light like Makes the Baby Go Blind. And basically the concept is that it's 30 plays performed in 60 minutes and they change what's being performed every two weeks or so. So for the past few years, it's been a constantly changing and evolving show. And so what they decided they would do with Broadcaster, and I think this was in, in um, honor of National Theater Month or National Theater Week or something, it was earlier in 2011, they said, we want to do 30 plays in 30 blocks. And so if you go to Second Avenue in Manhattan and you walk from Houston Street up to 29th Street, you can here are 30 plays and 30 blocks and sirens. <laughs> now, some of those plays are requests for you to do things. So you go to the geographic location, you click on the pin, and it asks you to do something. Maybe it asks you to yell at the falafel vendor. Maybe it asks you to engage a random person and ask them for a stick of gum. It asks you to do things. Another play may be a small ditty, a little short song that it plays for you while you're standing in a particular space. Another one may be an actual three minute play with multiple voices going back and forth. But what they've done is they've taken this idea for what they normally might perform in a theatrical space. They're using this new social media tool that allows them to have access to the public so that they can engage the public who's walking around and on the broadcaster app who can experience things in a new way. So, participatory culture has strong support for creating and sharing one's creations with others. How many of you are familiar with Eric Whitaker and the Virtual Choir? Okay, so for the last couple of years, Eric Whitaker, who is a cultural, uh, who's a choral composer, sorry, um, he came up with this idea. 
He wanted to be able to work with singers from all around the world, but his budget really didn't allow for that. So he was like, okay, what if I created a virtual choir? So he then began this process where he would have the pieces of music for each uh, voice, each vocal group. So sopranos would be able to download a PDF of the music for the sopranos. The altos would be able to download a PDF for them. Everybody would be able to download a PDF for their, vo their vocal range. And then they would watch a YouTube video of Eric conducting the piece. And as they're watching that, they would record a video of themselves singing the track. Then they would submit that video. They would send that video to Eric. He and his producers would take all of that material and aggregate it into a single vocal performance track. And then they would sync it with a video. And the video would show, originally the video looked like risers, and it would have the video, little video screens for each performance going across. So you have all the sopranos over here, the altos here, you know how it goes, you've all seen them. Um, now he's gotten a little more crazy with it <laughs> because um, he's had more participants. And so he's found a new way to visualize it. So recently he started almost creating like these organic shapes. They're almost like spheres that are connected with one another. And the spheres contain the actual video screens showing people singing their tracks. And you can see how all of these spheres are connected to one another. But at the same time, what you're hearing is this aggregated composition, this aggregated track. His most recent virtual choir experiment, uh, he received vocal tracks from over 2,000 singers, which he then combined and aggregated into a single performance track from over 58 countries. That's pretty strong support for creating and sharing creations with other people because then he took all of that and he shared it with the world for free through YouTube. And that particular performance is called Sleep and so far has been viewed by over 350,000 people. His uh, previous experiment called Lux Arm Q, I think, I'm not sure if that's the pronunciation. Close, good enough. Um, has been seen by over 2.2 million people. Participatory culture has some type of informal mentorship whereby what is known by the most experienced pa is passed along to novices. San Francisco Symphony has a new program called Community of Music Makers. And what it's doing is it's inviting amateur um, instrumentalists, amateur singers to come into the symphony space and to work with the professionals on developing their talent. And it also provides online coaching. It's real simple. It's a real simple use of technology, but it's such a great way of sharing that connection. And, wh and what you need to learn from this is learn to love your amateurs Stop demonizing the amateurs because we're all professionals. Get over that. Stop demonizing the amateurs. The amateurs are going to be your strongest audience base because they love the same thing you do and they recognize how well you do it. In a participatory culture, members believe that their contributions matter. In April, uh, a choreographer by the name of Jonah Boker. Um, he's been working with uh, students at Georgia Tech University in Atlanta. Um, and he has created a piece 
that uses a mobile app device called Mass Mobile, where Mass Mobile allows the audience to download the app for free and they can make changes to the environment of the stage while the players are performing and the players will respond to the changes that are made in the environment. So it actually changes the dance piece. So the audience members basically they can say, I want this to happen, and it's on a voting process, so the more people in the audience who want this to happen, the more likely it is that that will rise to the top, so that particular change will take place on stage. This is a direct way of involving the audience in the participation and creation of the work, in a unique way. In a participatory culture, members feel some degree of social connection with one another. How many of you are familiar with Improv Everywhere? Okay, Improv Everywhere is a company in New York and they do a lot of prank improv kind of things, but one of the things I love about them is this thing called the MP3 experiment. Basically, Improv Everywhere, they upload an MP3 file to their website. People can go download it, put it on their iPods, whatever they have, and then they will synchronize their watches with an atomic clock that's on the website. And at a particular time, they all go to a public space and they turn on their iPods and play the track and do what the narrator, Steve, tells them to do. And 2010, they had over 3,000 people do this. 3,000 people who started off in the financial district ended up in Bryant Park where they had a big toilet paper mummy dance fest. <laughs> but they all felt really connected to one another. <laughs> so at the base of all of this, all of these things I'm talking about have in common is a sense of play. For too long we have been playing to our audiences and playing for our audiences and today I challenge you to play with your audience. Thank you.